So we find ourselves today in the midst of an unfolding, bloody global war. But in many ways, this is just the kinetic phase of a long-running hybrid war that stretches back decades. To Chechnya in 1995, to Syria in 2012, to the events of January 6, 2021, and now to Kiev, Kiev in February of 2022. So we failed to stop this. How did this happen? How did we let this get to this phase? Well, I studied disinformation. And what we've been focusing on in the world of disinformation is really all of the artifacts and the messaging that we see on social media, things on Twitter and Facebook, things that we think of as just being false or you know, incorrect information. But that doesn't really help us get at what's actually going on. How does this kind of hybrid warfare that's rooted in information warfare have such a big effect on society and lead us into these violent kinetic conflicts? So to understand what's going on um, sort of above the level of artifacts and messaging, we have to look at actors and the networks, the people that are producing these things and how they're connected together. But even that isn't enough. We have to look at the long-term interests that are being served by their activity. That helps us to understand maybe where the money is coming from and how the money is moving around. That gets us the current context. But to really understand why stuff is happening, we have to look at the history. And that's really what I've been focused on, is connecting the artifacts that we see in disinformation and social media back to the history that produce these effects in the world. So a lot of people studying disinformation have been spending time, in these, time only in these lower two tiers. And that has led us to some very bad effects in society that we'll go over. Now, when we look at Russia in particular, um, Tsarist Russia, basically Putin, a lot of people have been saying that he's after restoring the Soviet Union's landmass. That isn't quite right. He wants to go back to the Tsarist times, to the Romanov times, to restore the land that was present in the, so in the Russian Empire then. And, you know, he's actually, Putin is annoyed with the uh, Bolsheviks for having lost landmass uh, during the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, if you look at the people advising Putin, you go to Alexander Dugin, who was a philosopher and political strategist, geopolitical strategist. He was very interested in the Romanovs. He was at this wedding that occurred in 2019. And, you know, it's this idea of restoring the Romanov dynasty to uh, Russia. In 2020, the Russian Orthodox Church consecrated a huge cathedral that was dedicated to the military. Look at who's there. It's Shoigu, Gerasimov. This guy, Kirill I, who was the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church, has endorsed Putin's invasion of Ukraine. They like to think that they're bringing about what they call the Moscow Third Rome prophecy, where Moscow becomes the successor to Rome and Constantinople in the grand arc of uh, Catholic and Orthodox um, religion. P Dugan has also been a big uh, advocate of this idea of the heartland, which came from another political philosopher named H.J. Mackinder. And um, you know the idea that a big land-based empire like Russia is the heartland that possesses all of these traditional values associated with agriculture and food production and that sort of thing, and that these outer areas are the rim lands that are more marine oriented and that marine uh, culture produces a kind of corruption in society. Dugan also produced in 1997 a book called The Foundations of Geopolitics um, that was extremely influential and which uh, Putin has been following. And it really places uh, Russia and China into a kind of a big Eurasian empire that seeks to dominate that entire sphere of the world. And you'll notice that the UK and the US are placed into a bilateral alliance that becomes fundamentally irrelevant to the rest of the world. There's also a lot of tension around currency and money. So you've been hearing a lot about crypto lately and how that plays in with this conflict and the idea that crypto might be used to bypass sanctions by Russia. And this ties into similar kinds of sentiment in the United States. We see all this stuff over here from the Mises Institute and the John Birch Society that's all in line with the same messaging that we're seeing from Russia around crypto because there's a tension around the idea of central banks and fiat currency and they want to push towards sound money and the gold standard. This is a long-running historical conflict in society. So in Russia right now, they're talking about displacing 
Bitcoin with stuff that's actually tokens that are represented by uh, or backed by um, nickel and palladium. There's also a big push for northern shipping around the Arctic Circle, um, and the idea that uh, you know that could be a competitive route against the Suez Canal. Arctic oil is also a big issue. Uh, they want access to the big oil reserves that are in the Arctic, and that's you know something that they're competing for. So. Oil and gas are a big underlying theme of all of this. So the issue that we're kind of up against is that we are failing to address threats at threat speed. We're not keeping up with um, you know, what's actually happening in the world of, you know, we're seeing these disinformation effects and we're mapping them back to history, but nobody's talking about what this means. We're, we're not keeping up. So this is General Philip Breedlove. He's got a um, kind of a succinct way of saying that. Uh, the word you use makes it sound like because we're a liberal democracy, we can't fight the information fight. I don't agree with that at all. We don't have to lie. We simply have to tell the truth, tell it vigorously, and we have to tell it at threat speed, which is our biggest problem. We are not organized in our country to, to answer threat speed. I don't have time to go through my spiel, but how long did it take the United States to answer the MH17 shoot down? It's a trick question. We never did. We threw it over the transom and allowed the Dutch and the Malaysians to answer it. And that was two years later, and Russia was already on to nine more new lies in those two years. So exactly. So in warfare, there's a concept called the OODA loop that was uh, put together by uh, Colonel John Boyd, which really describes what fighter pilots do. As they're flying through the sky, they're constantly having to observe, orient, decide, and act. We have been overwhelmed in our input into our information system so that we cannot react appropriately in real time. Um, we are starting to get better in, at this. In recent weeks, you may recall in the run-up to the invasion that occurred, uh, the Biden administration started to release a lot of information in real time describing exactly what Putin was going to do. And in fact, that is what he ended up doing was the stuff that they had intelligence on. Had we been doing this for the last five years or so, we might have been able to ward off some of the things that have happened because what we've had instead is a lot of denialism that these things were occurring at all. Basically gaslighting us all into thinking that, uh, no, the Russians weren't really a threat when in fact they ultimately became a huge threat, not only to the Ukrainians, but to all of us. I've been working on tools for the last uh, you know, several years that help us to try to make sense of the threat landscape in real time and this is just a little screenshot of a project that I've been working on that helps us to see the connections between players in the disinformation landscape. As analysts, as open source intelligence professionals and media folks uh, are coming across new information that seems to come out of nowhere, they need to be able to plug into tools like this that can provide some level of context that help them to understand what they're seeing, why they're seeing it, what networks it connects to, and how it relates historically to long-term motivations of uh, you know, persistent actors. So we might start to look at kind of a new model that I think resembles somewhat what intelligence agencies do, but this is something that we all need to be doing. This is something that media and reporters and other kinds of analysts need to be doing in real time. We need to be looking at the threats that we think are on the landscape making predictions about them, that is key, and then testing those predictions. Do the things that we think are gonna happen based on what we understand actually happening, and if not, or if they are, we can take the data that we get from those observations and feed it back into this. In the meantime, we need to constantly be feeding in knowledge of history and the interests that you know, accompany this, like I mentioned with you know, the gold standard. That's a, a conflict that goes back 100 years. You have to have really good historical understanding in order to be able to evaluate these kinds of you know, disinformation artifacts. So many people in the world of tech don't have great background with history and vice versa. So we need to marry those worlds more. So we take those kinds of uh, you know, insights, bring them into our predictions, and then also you know, there's people whose job it is to counter the adversary, people in the world of counterintelligence, people in the military, people in defense. They need to be figuring out ways to make it harder for the bad guys to keep doing the stuff that they're trying to do. Um, so, you know, what about disinformation itself? What effect does that have on all of us? Well, by paying attention only to these bottom two tiers and basically pretending that these upper two tiers don't exist, we get really myopic and focused on, well, you know, there's all this stuff about anti-vax and COVID lockdowns and, you know, people are protesting uh, COVID and ma mandates and driving around the DC beltway. Well, what is that really doing to us as a society? I would argue that it's 
tearing apart the complexity of our society, taking the rich, complex interactions that exist between us and reducing them down into these small, unruly, cultish networks that don't talk to each other. This is a network model of such a uh, you know, set of effects on a society, and I think that this models, at least you know, conceptually, what's happening to us to a large degree. So I like to use this analogy that it's kind of like a forest fire. You know, we've basically, disinformation has taken all of the connections, all of the complex interrelationships and balances that exist between us and lit it on fire. And with that, it has left us with just nothing but ruin all around. And people want to say, well, we should just put some truth on that, right? It'll fix that. <laughs> no, it won't. We have to figure out how to grow back these connections that have been burned away between us and rebuild our society to increase trust and increase the amount of complexity that exists between us. So, you know, we say never again, but that is never enough. We really can't afford this kind of delay. We have to figure out how to intercept these kinds of inf information operations before they turn into kinetic operations. We need to connect the artifacts that we're seeing in real time and disinformation to the history that drives them, and we need to build predictive models. And we also need to rebuild the social fabric that has been so terribly burned away between us all. I'd like to close by asking for a moment of silence for the victims of this current conflict, the people that we have failed to protect. Thank you.